So, welcome friends and foes to the Forensic Focus podcast. Uh, I'm Desi, and as always, I'm joined with the, by the lovely Sai. And this week's podcast is sponsored by Magnet Forensics, and we have Matt, who is the director for Memory IR and R and D. Thanks for jumping on with us, Matt, and um, glad you could make it with us. Well, thanks uh, for the invitation, guys. No, it's a pleasure. Um, so, I mean, we've not met before, and uh, although I am familiar with uh, mm. with Magnet as a as a provider, and um, I, I sort of spoke with some of your guys at a trade show, uh, not terrible. Well, it is terribly long ago now. Uh, this year has uh, has flown by, but uh, recently enough to for for, for good memory. Um, tell us, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us a bit about uh, Magnet. How how did you um, get into to to being with Magnet, and what's your background? Sure. So, well, I guess like 15 years ago, I started a memory acquisition tool called uh, Dumpit. It used to be called uh, Win32 DD, mm -hmm. and I kept working on it and uh, did a bunch of work regarding like memory forensic, memory analysis. And uh, most recently, uh, so like a few years ago, I started a startup called Comet Technologies, where we focused on uh, using like memory for incident response. So it was a continuation of all the work uh, that I did in the past around memory acquisition and memory analysis to turn it into a platform, into something that's more like, uh, that can be easily like used by analysts and uh, practitioners. And uh, that company has been acquired by Magnet at the beginning of uh, so 2022, so at the beginning of this year. And uh, that's how I got uh, like the, the opportunity to be part of the uh, Magnet family. Fantastic. Um, and your background really before cool. before that was uh, you are an incident response guy or um, academia uh, or uh... yeah, mostly mostly like security research. So a lot of the things I would do would be like uh, related to like doing uh, Windows kernel research. Uh, for instance, stuff like uh, documenting the Windows hibernation file was one of uh, my uh, early work uh, because like uh, I had to reverse like the Windows kernel, rewrite the compression algorithm uh, so we could like decompress like Windows hibernation file. And then after that, uh, yeah, mostly like kernel stuff until like uh, decided to like uh, branch out and to do uh, an application virtualization startup with a friend of mine, uh, which was called Cloud Volumes, that got acquired by VMware uh, around like uh, 2014. And uh, after that, I decided to come back into security because I still, uh, well, I'm still part of the review board of a bunch of like uh, security conferences, like uh, Black Hat, Blue Hat, like Shack Account. So I've always been involved in the uh, security community, even when I was not professionally active inside the uh, security community. Yeah, that's really cool. There's, there's so many, like I know a lot of our listeners will have used at least one of those, if not more more than one so it's really cool to to meet one person who's had so much influence on so many like influential tools within the industry that's kind of used day to day um especially in the the old sense of instant response and forensics and, and using especially like dump it in that which is still used today um in some places which is cool that's what we're, that's what we're all trying to do right like uh, yeah yeah tools to uh, the life of people easier and yeah. uh, if it's something that can be repeated as a process or if we can expand the field of research mm. for people to uh, either save time or be able to like you know like catch bad guys more efficiently like uh, it's always a good thing um, yeah and every time we spend time on something like usually like we like it to have an impact right uh, for instance like yeah. the, the podcast you guys are doing you know i'm sure like you enjoy doing it because you get like different perspective and that's something fun, you know, like it helps to expand the horizon of like, like the audience to get new ideas, etc. Like mm. to, to keep uh, communication going. Like in my case, it's through like building tools, you know, so. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't write code, really so cool. it has to be a podcast. So. <laughs> 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 you just need to take a boot camp uh, coding course there. Sorry. What? I, I've got my, uh, I don't know, as, as to, discussed, to I have year. my, uh, my um, assembly language book turning up soon, so you know it'll be fun. Yep. Um, there you go. Anyway, okay. 
Um, so I guess you can like, always learn Rust. You know, if you're looking for language to use, like in the long term, like Rust, like all those memory safe languages, you know, they're becoming like extremely popular. Like uh, mm. there's like a lot of like best practice like reports coming out. Uh, there is more like coming out like for like t next year on like yeah. why it's a good like uh, alternative to like C and C plus uh, plus if you start like uh, from scratch. Some of, some of the bigger um, ransomware groups were. Um, changing their code base into Rust from like what I was yeah. seeing towards the end of my instant response, um, yeah. which I thought was more to do with for them efficiency of encryption and and all that, but I'm not super sure. Like, I mean, I think it's also because like ransomware groups now, like the developers are becoming like pretty good. Mm. So based on the technology people use, you can tell like how advanced they are in terms yeah. of understanding technology. Uh, you you will not hear like a ransomware group. I mean, you could. It happened a few times. So like, where they would use like Python or Delphi, you know, to like write stuff. But as soon as you start to see like you know they're using Rust, etc., you can tell they have a really good understanding of like a lot of uh, low level uh, system stuff. You know, so yeah. like you know you would have to write a driver, all those things. Um, mm. A lot of malwares and uh, ransomware, usually in terms of techniques. If we look at like all the TTPs from the MITRE attack framework, they would use a uh, very similar modus operandi. Mm -hmm. But now you can see like the evolution because usually it's not like one group doing everything. They split yeah. task and they yeah. learn how to collaborate. And I think that's yeah. why we see them like using Go and Rust and all those like you know, cutting edge like technology. Mm. So that's probably like a, a good point there. Like we're talking about criminals. Um, I know one of the topics we wanted to talk about today was uh, e-crime and, and info stealers. Um, so where do you kind of see as the starting, like the, the modern starting point of, of e-crime and, and info stealers that it, like everyone's kind of has been facing today and facing like over the past couple of years? Yeah. Uh, well, e-crime is a big problem now, uh, obviously, like, as we all know, uh, you know, ranging from, like, business email compromise to ransomware. Mm. Uh, but this year, uh, we started to see a shift in terms of modus operandi. Like, I think, and the big shift we are starting to see, and it was mentioned by uh, Vitaly uh, Kremers, uh, like, a few months ago. He has been tracking a lot of, like, uh, different groups is very active uh, in the threat intelligence uh, community is that a lot of the uh, major like ransomware gangs are kind of changing their business model to move towards like you know like hacking stealing you know extor uh, extortion like leaking uh, documents uh, instead of just like blindly encrypting files Mm -hmm. Whereas like before, mm -hmm. they would just encrypt your files, ask for a ransom, and try to get money out of it. But in that case, you know, like you know, it's public; it goes in the news. Whereas like now, with the uh, info stealer like modus operandi that we start to see more and more, mm -hmm. it does not have to be public, which usually is also an incentive for companies, uh, unless like regulations are pushing them to disclose every time they have been compromised. But also like a new way of monetizing uh like cyber crime yeah so yeah. that uh that itself you know like and they would we would see them collaborating more and more i mean like this year like we started to see and we learned more about like the modus modus operandi of those ransomware uh groups like the conti uh group because a lot of their chat logs have been leaked yeah um but that shift to like uh, what we call like info stealers, where either they would get in your network or they would buy access to your network to an initial access broker, uh, mm -hmm. which is something uh, very common in the underground. Mm -hmm. And then you would see, uh, well, a financially uh, motivated attacker coming inside your network and trying to like steal as much information uh, as they can after doing a bunch of like lateral movements. Uh, and then they would just like, you know, like try to blackmail you and uh, get money out. And now, like because of like that, uh, you know, the usage of um, initial access brokers, uh, IABs, mm -hmm. sometimes you'd have multiple like actors in your network. So from an incident response standpoint, it's also becoming uh, a bit more complex to identify 
within your network if you're in a scenario like this. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, like, while, while I was researching um, for, for this chat with you today, I was looking up info stealers and, and kind of seeing where they, they've come from. So you see attackers used to, um, like, in one of the previous talks, like, hit banks quite a lot. And then they went to corporate because the security level was lower. Um, bar eventually was easier, easier and, you, and it's kind of attackers will always go for the, the lowest common denominator. Um, what's easiest for them, least path, path of resistance. Um, do you think with, and some of the articles were suggesting that because everyone's put money into like crypto and, and NFTs and you've got this um, kind of like decentralized economy that um, attackers might reshape their attack path to more of a consumer level again so they're attacking individuals rather than kind of like a corporate corporate sense as kind of corporates catching up with security um well for like attackers to target like users you know like usually they're like smaller like uh, pockets you know like they're like mm. smaller like quote unquote like budget it's not really like a good like target customer uh, yeah. if you have like if you're running a criminal uh, criminal organization you may as well just go after like large organization and focus on it. Um, and with that shift of like, because we saw it with like one Akari and not Petya. It's like, okay, once you have been infected by ransomware, it's pretty obvious because your screen is going to like turn red. Mm. All your fi files mm. are encrypted. Everyone is panicking. What's going on? It's already like too late. You know, you have been breached. Mm. Whereas mm. like if you use a different approach of like, Staying in the network, it could be like a few weeks. In the, some cases, it's a few months. Like we can see in business email compromise. You can observe and learn a lot from an internal organization. Sometimes like the attackers will know more uh, than inter, uh, internal employees because they would have access to the emails. They would just like monitor all the emails. They would wait for you to go on vacation either to replace, uh, replace the invoice. In that case, they would expect a wire transfer on an actual bank account that they control. Uh, if it's like a ransom, you know, like they may ask like, uh, like uh, a transfer of like cryptocurrency, like even in the case of uh, the shadow brokers, when it happened a few years back, when they had mm. files that belong to um, uh, a major like uh, intelligence agency uh, with exploits, etc., while they were posting a blog post saying uh, people, okay, like you can wire us money there. They were trying to do like uh, like a bidding auction, uh, a bidding type of auction online for people to send uh, money there. So that's what it was already uh, used. In terms of like web-free security, so like you are saying like NFTs, cryptos, etc. cetera. Um, well, that's something we have seen a lot over the past years where if we are thinking of because there's different aspects, right? There is like, if you're an attacker to receive money to leverage like cryptocurrency, uh, which was always there and that's kind of like what ransomware were using, but because of like the security posture of people like within companies, most mm. of companies would know that they need backup. They're also moving more to cloud. Yeah. So a lot of the information they would have to encrypt would not be as efficient, you know, like if mm. two more like, I'm sure it's like your case too, if like, even if you're, you're losing your laptop, you know, like, you're like, okay, like I still have my files because usually they are safe somewhere if you're writing mm. code, you know, it's in a code repository. It's not that dramatic. It's more about like not having a third party accessing it. Um, whereas like uh, we've, so that usage on like cryptocurrency for transfer, you know, like I think it's debatable, like it's used. It's, but I, one of the things we see a lot uh is for instance like and we have seen it for like the past five years since 2017 is like crypto exchanges being targeted because usually they they do manage a lot of money yeah they're like smaller banks they would manage like billions like we can see with ftx now like there's some like court document coming out saying that all the private keys were not even encrypted you know there's like all those things so if you're an attacker that's the dream target is just like you access you take the money out you will see also like some bridges, uh, like the uh, the Ronin bridge, which was like related to a video game being hacked. And then you would see like hundreds of millions of dollars being moved mm. uh, because they are like kind of like smaller, like central banks with really bad security or like the code would be available. So there's like all those new vectors 
around the web three that are also like uh, present. Uh, there's still something I think like traditional security is catching up on because it's such a different like scene, like mm -hmm. all the crypto web three uh, scene. Uh, and I think a lot of security people like didn't really dig much uh, into it because you would have to learn about like smart contract security, like uh, and all the different languages, like some smart contracts, you would have to learn mm. a new language like Solidity, or you would have to write them in Rust. Uh, whereas like traditional security, when it comes to like detection, well, it's more oriented around rules and things they can uh, instrument like Yara rules, detection rules. So you need to have like a product in place, but for like crypto companies, yeah, it's definitely a, uh, a, a big problem and uh, and I think the fact that it's really hard now for like defenders or corporations to detect a threat internally uh, they could stay in your system for like months that's why mm. like you need to do active like uh, like uh, threat hunting and all those things mm. uh, rather than just mm. waiting for like okay we have been infected by ransomware because the screen is red okay let's try to see what happened because by that time you know like the attacker would have done everything they want Mm. Uh, I think what we see now uh, is really the emphasis around detection and detection engineering and how it's changing and how it needs to change to be more advanced. As mm. like you said at the beginning, mm. like now we see like some of the attackers like writing, uh, you know, like they are ransomware in Rust. Uh, mm. There is like this... Uh, a ransomware called Blackbyte, they also had like a kernel driver with it where they were like actually uh, removing a lot of the callbacks that could be used by uh, EDR uh, solutions because then they would be like uh, undetectable. So they have like all those proactive bypass of security product being in place. Mm. And you can mm. see, and it makes sense because it's more profitable as a business. Companies are struggling with, you know, detection. Uh, they have a different focus on like, okay, like let's do security awareness around like uh, phishing emails. Let's use two-factor authentication, all those things. But when it comes to detection, when someone is in, if they come in with like an exploit, like we have seen like this year, like many times with IAS or like, and now we see more and more like um, all those zero days like being found in the wild, yeah. which is uh, instrumented by like, uh, attackers was like before like zero days would be like kind of like not as common as now uh but now we're like at peak security you have all those great security products that are supposed to like prevent breaches etc well the reality is like you're gonna get breached anyway but mm. what's your plan of action or like do uh, search for stuff like uh actively um yeah and i i think you're right on that like it's it's interesting in that we are seeing the development now and and the that mindset of you are going to get breached. What are you going to do? What's going to be interesting, I think, for how the attackers respond, because I know at least within Australia and, and other countries might be different, but the regulatory compliance on not paying ransom is so high here and the fines are so high compared to if they, if you get found out that you did pay a ransom uh, is quite severe. So if the money dries up, like if, if corporations get attacked, but the money dries up because they're not getting any ransom, like there's no business model to keep attacking right like they they either need to put the thumb down on more pressure and attack more critical systems which is terrible or they need a different model and and where are they going to shift to make their money um so like i guess that that'll be interesting seeing seeing in this new year where where that's going to go um at, at least for me in australia like because i think the pressure is on that they're not getting paid in ransom so they're doing work for nothing really yeah. yeah, no, definitely. And uh, I, mean, I guess we'll see if they're moving more yeah. towards like economic uh, like intelligence and all those mm. things where, you know, mm. keep it uh, secret. Yeah. So with the, um, with the move away from, you know, specifically sort of drops and ransomware that is, is doing uh, encryption and, uh, and that kind of things, are, are you, is the memory forensic side of things becoming more important to try and detect... Uh, active threats within a, a network because there's less evidence in other areas. Is this um, is this driving the, the the desire to do memory forensics? I mean, I come from a, a a dead forensics background. I mean, I do criminal cases whereby the police have kicked in the door and seized the computer, and there's no memory, or once in a blue moon, there's there is there memory. So from my side, this this is 
exciting and interesting and fascinating, but I have no real appreciation of how it actually uh, provides use. So in, in, in your experience, is this, you know, memory is your um, <laughs> expertise area. Is, is this something that we're going to have to look at more going forward because of the, the nature of the changing attacks? Yeah, very good question. Uh, like the short answer is definitely yes. And even like you would tend to see people are like, I'm not really using the uh, term like memory forensic anymore. What you will see a lot is like people talking about memory analysis as a large category to include like file less threats. And more recently, like what we see a lot called being uh, like leaving off the land uh, type of threats. So that's something we see like more and more um, because yeah, if you're not, I mean like the same like concept of like, okay, if you're not touching the disk, well, there is like a lot of operations, you know, that you are like not uh, logging in. If you're just like using process injection from one process to another, uh, if you're on exploit, you don't even need to touch the disk really, you know, just like, just like inject your payload in memory. And we see that also for mobile, like a lot of like those uh, zero day click like threats. Uh, a lot of them are like fileless, you know, getting a missed call, you know, like boom. <laughs> uh, it makes it harder and harder to like detect like threats. and. Then, on actual like servers, uh, either like Mac, Linux, or Windows, uh, being able to analyze a system beyond what you collect in terms of like telemetry from like your XDR solutions is becoming more and more like uh, relevant because as attackers are becoming, becoming more and more evolved, uh, they understand how to bypass a lot of the traditional uh, like secure telemetry that a lot of companies would collect uh, most of the time telemetry is great, but you also need to think of like the blind spot you could have from like telemetry. For instance, like we were saying before, if you have something like a ransomware, like BlackBite, which is gonna load a kernel driver, look at the callback functions registered uh, within the kernel, remove them, making it uh, completely blind uh, for like any telemetry solution you have, you not know what's happening after. That's why, like, doing active like pro hunting and all those things uh, is being relevant. And that's uh, obviously, like, uh, like, like you said, you know, something we're working on, trying to make it more accessible for people, uh, without having to be like, you know, like uh, a kernel expert. Uh, but as we see more and more like old days uh, being found in the wild, and as like those groups are more and more like advanced, and we like kind of like stay in your network for a long time, being able to actively like hunt for stuff beyond like basic queries where like you would have like your traditional like uh, tools, like whatever XDR solution you have where you can run your like quick queries, like always query or Velociraptor, all those things. Uh, where there are more and more scenarios where you need to go beyond asking those like basic questions where like, okay, this is like an image of a machine where we are like pretty much sure it has been infected because it's a critical asset. And if it, if it has not been uh, infected, well, at least we need to have confirmation that there is nothing like suspicious on it. And usually that would be more than just checking if a file is present and all those things. Um, so yeah, like understanding like memory and the internal of operating systems now is becoming more and more important. You talk a lot about um, making it as easy as possible. Um, one of the, the the sort of ongoing questions that we have when we're talking to, to vendors is, is where do we draw the line in providing push button forensics? Um, you know, somebody needs to be able to understand what they're getting out of a tool uh, in order to be able to really action it. Um, how 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 do you feel about that? And is in the, in the terms of the training that Magnet provides, you know, when you when you're teaching people to use this tool, are you going into depth about what the actual meaning of a, of, of these things is? Um, yeah, we do. So there are like frameworks, you know, that uh, like the mate, uh, Mitre attack framework that kind of provide like um, like a midway vocabulary for like entry level analysts, where you have an existing like framework with existing definition and if you are like a detection product, at least you can like leverage this to have like a common like vocabulary for like people to understand. 
Uh, I think from on the scale of things, you know, I think it's very helpful in that sense where, like you just said, you know, like you need to provide results that people can understand. Uh, Whereas, like if you would just be like talking to attackers, like those group of like um, attackers that are collaborating with each other, for them it's very specific. It's like, well, we bypass like A, B, C. This is what we do, and this is all we get in. This is like what we're gonna use. Uh, the mindset is very different. You know, they will not think as a checklist. You know, like there's this like um, this quote from uh, John Lambert saying like, oh, like defenders are like thinking in checklist, and attackers are thinking in graph. Because, you know, like if you, the, the, and the, it's a really good and difficult question to answer in the sense where like, if you're a defender today, you're either going to be driven by regulation or saying, okay, we need to like get uh, that checklist uh, compliant. Sometimes you may even waste like some time, uh, uh, like on stuff that are not necessarily like uh, very significant or like protecting you against like what you should be focusing on. But it's still good to have like this because it allows you to get more budget and then to put the right people in place. Whereas like if you're an attacker, you don't need to do any like security awareness or education. You're gonna focus on your KPI, on your objectives, you know, and that's it. Whereas like if you're a defender, like you said, you know, like you need to be able to like kind of educate people on like, okay, why do you need to do this? This is the reason why you need to do it. And uh, this is how you can do it. Was well, like if you're an attacker, you just don't care. Just like I'm, I'm, I'm going in. You know, it's like, <laughs> give me the hammer. You know? <laughs> is is there value yeah. then in teaching people to attack? Should we be should we be educating people from both sides of this? You know, is it? Would you recommend that any incident response person also does a uh, their, their training in? Let's call it ethical hacking, but maybe not because that involves still following a checklist. Like, red, like in red teaming and red teaming, yeah. So th there, there is there is benefit in learning uh, how an attack works, but I think the reality of it, uh, and personally, like if people are saying, "Oh, like uh, I need to learn more about offense," you know, usually they would do like things that are like really basic, not necessarily like representative of like how a real attack works. I guess you know that would be one of the downside. I'm always advocating for people to learn about like proper like software engineering because that gives you way more doors than you know like learning like how to use like Kali and all those things. Um, but in terms of uh, learning offense, and I'm talking from experience, like there's like a, a blog post that should come out like this week where I was looking at uh, one of the uh, zero day. Uh, or a zero click like attack that was uh, released like last year, just trying to reproduce the exploit. The complexity of writing an exploit now in 2022, 2020, uh, 2023 is way beyond what it was 10 years ago. So if you're a defender, for switching from defense to offense, I mean, there is massive benefit, but the, the gap of expertise is becoming so wide now that even if you would want to, it's really hard. And you still need to be able to ask the right questions to the right people to progress. You can go to trainings and stuff. That's definitely uh, helpful. But if you want to stay uh, up to date on the current like state of the art or like attacks, remote code execution on all those things or like all things are being like, uh, you know, like, uh, it's going to be very difficult to have like a very precise understanding of it. Obviously, you don't need to know all the details. Like most of the time, you need like just like kind of like the ABC or like you know like the MITRE attack framework. Like is very helpful because it's like okay, that's what it's being used, uh, what it's using. Um, but from an application security standpoint, as we start to see like exploits uh, being used more and more in the wild. Um, it's becoming very hard because like even we saw it with when I cry when people are like, well, just update your system. That's it. You know, like there's a patch available, you know, you just need to patch it. Yeah. Uh, but now, yeah. like as we see more and more like zero days, there's no patch available or like even like patching like system in production is very complicated because, well, a significant amount of time you may have your system down or you need to test like patching, et cetera, et cetera. Like even like updating a personal machine or a phone is like complicated because it feels like 
we have updates all the time, you know, we just spend our time updating our system, you know. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, there is value in it. It's just extremely hard to know everything now. You need, even like people writing exploits now, the way they work, you would not have one person writing an exploit. You would have people who are specialized like in uh, finding bugs and they're gonna have different like specialities, you know, like deadlisting, fuzzing, etc. Then when it comes to exploitation, uh, some people are gonna be specialized only in browser exploitation. Some people are gonna be specialized in routers exploitation. Some people are gonna be specialized on only iOS exploitation. Some people on Android and Windows. So it's like becoming so complex and that's why we start to see like the prices of like exploit and the um you know uh by like all those like gray market like uh, marketplace uh that we know of you know in the public eyes raising their prices uh so much for a lot of the exploit is because it's so hard now to write exploits and even understand how they work and by the time we get time also if you're a defender you spend so much time uh reading through like events, like doing triage of alerts, mm. you know, like chasing, like the chasing your own tail that, you know, after that, you still need to find like the mental like bandwidth to like, okay, I want to do some <laughs> research and learn about ABC, which is a huge problem because you have a certain amount of time that you can allocate to like learning, yeah. you know, from like your day yeah. job. And I think that's one of the biggest problems of security. Um, because if you have more time to do research, like you understand, what you need better also and where you know where you could collaborate and i guess that's one of the good thing with open source because you get like people like from different places and they can collaborate in a very like uh, an orthodox way um but it's difficult to find like yeah the time on focus and uh, it's understandable especially like now you get so many like false positive like alert fatigues and all those things that yeah, if you want to find like free time on the side, I have friends of mine, like they literally want to like quit their job just to spend like a full year just doing research, not being paid, just to like learn about stuff. They're like, I'm spending so much time like doing like uh, bureaucracy or anything like with my work that I don't have the time I want to do like research, you know, because they genuinely enjoy research, you know, yeah. and uh, we're reaching that it. stage. <laughs> I found a strange issue is that um, with, I mean, I didn't, I, I used to do at least some commuting. Um, but now I'm working from home so much. I don't even get 30, 30 minutes or a couple of hours a week on the train to sit and listen to something or read something or do it. It's funny how the world has yeah. changed in that regard. I'm also suffering from the fact I'm getting old, which means that every time I learn something new, I forget yeah. something that I should be remembering, which is um, <laughs> not, not but it terribly is true. helpful. It, 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 is, yeah. uh, it is also a problem because like staying up to date now, it's hard and imagine it's with you having an existing base of knowledge uh so if you're a newcomer now you may learn faster so like if you, like i see it with people like specializing in some like uh most of the people i see know like learning reverse engineering like the new generation of people they would either come from like the ctf scene or because they used to write like cheats for like video games that's also a pretty big like uh <laughs> mm, scene yeah. that was not that big like before because all the uh, protection bypass and all those techniques they are learning uh because now if you want to like hack one of those like online games it's like pretty hard you know like mm. they, it's more advanced than a lot of the xdr solution you would know about yeah. but around this there is like what we call like being part of a community with private knowledge where you can ask the right question and get the right answer or like yeah. have existing like knowledge resources that you can leverage to learn uh so, so I had, yeah i had i had another question just on um i guess the the memory um when we we're talking about using it in instant response and from my experience and probably a lot of people who have done this kind of thing and especially in forensics is how do you do it at scale because especially when you're looking for a, a fileless threat and you're doing threat hunting, like memory scanning generally is even using lightweight tools is very expensive and very, very time intensive. So I guess it'd be really good to hear your thoughts on how you approach a threat hunt where you don't necessarily have an initial indicator or you don't know where it is in the network, but how do you approach that and how do you go find that in memory? Um, well, you would always have like some information, right, telling you where to go. Because if you have a suspicion on, 
Yeah, so let's say uh, let's say it's like a suspicion at that you've got. You have a yeah. suspicion on what has been compromised or what you don't want uh, to be compromised. So, like for instance, your critical assets. You know, so yeah. I guess that's where you do like the different like tier one, tier two, tier three of like uh, incident response analysis. Like you know, if you have like phishing, you're gonna start to like narrow down on like your scope. Yeah. Uh, on what do you think is relevant? Uh, and even if you're like, like I was saying before, we were like those like uh, rootkits that we see more and more that are like kind of clearing all the callback functions. Um, you would see like an event happening before. So you would see like, okay, they entered here, you know, or, and then they disappeared, but you would have like a starting point. Um, and obviously, mm. like, that's not something you would find like immediately. Uh, or you need like a bunch of people working on it, etc. You know, or and then they disappeared. But you would have like a starting point. Um, and obviously, like that's not something you would find like immediately. Um, mm. Or you need like a bunch of people working on it, etc. Like probably like few weeks to understand exactly uh, what happens. But you would always have like some sort of like. Uh, suspicion uh, and when it comes to memory like that's something you would use for like for instance like critical assets so once you have identified like assets that have been compromised or may have been compromised mm. Um, mm. and you don't have to do the same thing like the disk like you would not do like full uh, disk acquisition all the time you may just do like like a process like a memory image or for like critical assets you would want to do like a full uh, disk or full memory acquisition because maybe that's something you're gonna need uh, like in a year or two years from now for like a legal case mm. or in the case of uh, even something with memory if you can schedule like uh, memory snapshots over time you know let's say like for like critical assets let's say if you're a bank you have a a Swift uh, server where you have like, you know, really critical information coming in and out. We have seen some Swift service bureau being compromised in the past. Like last time we heard of something like this happening, like publicly was like many years ago. It does not mean that uh, third vector like disappeared or something with like ATMs, you know, mm -hmm. while well, you may want to schedule like, you know, memory snapshots and use that as a raw form of log follow your critical assets because obviously it's like you know a big chunk of uh, it's it's large very big uh at least you would always have the opportunity in the future let's say one or two years from now depending on how long you you keep those uh like logs you know uh to come back and do some retro hunting because you would have oh during those 24 months period like this vendor release like some new iocs about uh, this uh, threat, we think we may have been a target. So let's run those IOCs on that memory image we have from like one or two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, at least you would be able to answer the question of like, okay, have we been compromised between like that period and we didn't know yeah. about. Um, so it's, it sounds like uh, at, at a basic level, it's have the visibility in your network with the correct telemetry to, to kind of do the threat hunting that you need to do either historically or or at the time um yeah but like and i and i guess a lot of our listeners know like it it is a difficult thing to threat hunt when you and and you can't when you don't have visibility because you can't find what you can't see much the same yeah, as trying to find definitely. things in the real world when you can't see it yeah it's, <laughs> it's funny that yeah, put a blindfold yeah. on and find something yeah uh, so I mean, I'm, and uh, yeah, like, you need all sort of like telemetry, like your network telemetry, like mm. email telemetry, endpoint telemetry. I guess like no memory telemetry, if we can call it like this. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, it's a good term for it. I mean, uh, you know, it's it, it's interesting that we come back effectively to deviation from baseline, which has been the sort of traditional um, methodology of detecting unusual behaviour. Just we're doing it with a larger data set across different things um, that allows us to do that. I think that's uh, that's quite cool. Um, I, I I hear a rumor that you have um, some 
experience with regard to um, chat GPT. Does that have an acronym that gets pronounced in any different way? I've only ever read it. I've never actually spoken to anyone about it yet. Is it just chat GPT? Oh, like, yeah, it's just chat GPT. So it's by OpenAI, uh, which is like a massive company. You know? like their last investment is a billion dollar for Microsoft. Uh, wow. So it didn't come out of nowhere. Business. It was in the work. Like, well, I mean, we have seen. Uh, we, I guess, uh, I don't, I don't, I cannot remember like a one billion dollar investment in uh, in security. Uh, maybe, maybe you're right. But uh, yeah, like uh, I mean, everyone has been talking about it. Um, I don't, so you say you didn't play with it. Uh, I haven't played with it yet. I, I mean, I, I can say I've mm -hmm. seen I've seen various things going past on Twitter between. The, the one that interested me the most was actually somebody persuading it to tell them how to hotwire a car. Um, but I, I, <laughs> I've sort of seen an article being put forward that suggests that there may be a use for this in the creation of malware. And that that's a, a, a real... Is that a real problem? I, 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 I'm going to say I have enough trouble writing code myself. So understanding that an AI can do it better than me, whilst totally plausible... Does you know have some some sort of doubts in my mind? What, what's your opinion on this? Um, that's a good question. Actually, like um, wh when I was at um, Black Hat uh, last week, where in the the round table we had, uh, that's uh, that's something that came up a lot. So remember at the beginning when I was saying uh, of our discussion, when I was saying, well, if you want to learn now. One of the big problems is to know how to ask the right questions to the right people. And that's all you can like progress like way faster when you're learning. Mm -hmm. I think the best mm -hmm. way to look at uh, chat GPT and all those like LLM, you know, like large uh, language models is that first, I think human operators like us are going to be better at articulating questions when we need something, when uh, we try to understand something. Uh, which is, I'm sure, like we all had our fair of uh, amount of frustrations when talking with people, saying, "Well, it's not working." It's like, and then you have to send back a questionnaire of like, I mean, the the reason for like a questionnaire and checklist is because like people don't always know how to articulate like a problem, and because we need to like give them a journey into explaining and mm -hmm. narrating their problems. So now, uh, as humans. Uh, we're gonna be able to like formulate those questions better and better, and we're gonna have like very detailed answers. So if you think of like a, a SQL type of database where you write your SQL query and you query a database, there's a specific format for like questions, and you get data back. You kind of know what you have to ask. Uh, think of that as the next generation of like SQL queries, where instead of being a SQL query, it's gonna be uh, leveraging like the human language it could be in English, could be in French, any other language, and the database itself. When in the case of Chat GPT, they use the internet to train that model. So any encyclopedia you can think of, like you know, like uh, Google results, like Stack Overflow, like GitHub, like everything you can think of. Uh, so in most of the cases, it's extremely accurate. It understands like. Uh, human language beyond the level, you know, that's, uh, I used it like a few times just to fix like grammar on some text. Or uh, then I have a friend of mine who uh, used it for like more complex questions where like, where write me like uh, some PowerShell script to download the malware and to connect to that domain name, etc. Uh, so like uh, my, my friend Todd, uh, like tried that query and it spit like uh, a script uh, in PowerShell uh, immediately. And, you know, it became viral on Twitter. Uh, whatever question you would ask with the right set of requirements uh, is going to come back with information. So for programming, there is definitely like obvious like benefits of like, because a lot of it is very redundant, uh, where you can use it, or okay, just pit me like uh, that code or convert, even in some cases, like that piece of code, like in Rust or whatever. Uh, so when it comes to like writing like malware or exploit, especially exploits, there's so many like unknown variables that you need to figure out as you write like your exploit uh, that it's impossible like at the moment because there's so many like unknown variables. But for a lot of redundant operation, and you think, if you think about it like to what we were saying before, 
if you're a defender, you get so many alerts to filter, so many things to like uh, to process, or like a lot of like you know like middleman operation whenever you want to get like a task being executed, and this is like full chain of command uh, to be passed, you know, just for like even emails between like uh, human operators. Uh, there is definitely a lot of value there. Uh, what I see, I would not be really worried of how it can be uh, used from a malicious standpoint, but more from like uh, an operational standpoint for like enterprise. Where like, where are we wast wasting time today, or can it uh, help us, or like even to learn? You know, as mentors, you know, if you want to learn programming now, you have like a like a small like mentor where you can ask questions and you get like extremely articulated like answers that's amazing you know so i think from a defensive like standpoint uh there is definitely like a, a lot of uh, benefits uh in terms of like you know for instance like fake news misinformation etc because it can write like uh, full-on articles you know if you want it can write tweets for you so maybe that's where there would be a danger uh it's kind of you could you could detect what's chat GPT uh, text like, but I think like very soon, like you will not be able to detect it because it's like the third generation of GPT now. There's already like a fourth generation like in the works that they haven't released yet. Um, all the promises we heard about AI over the past like 10 years with EDRs, like using AI to solve like crime and detect like breaches that didn't really work, but that was kind of enough for people to be like, oh, well, we're using AI to like solve cybersecurity and it was not really working. Well, we, we, we may see a next generation of uh, real AI actually like helping operators to answer their questions, for instance, or like filter events. Uh, whereas like 10 years ago, a lot of security vendors were basically over-promising what AI could do. I think now we're entering in that new generation where AI is becoming more mainstream. People understand what uh, what are like the limitation of machine learning and how it can help, uh, like you know, uh, people. Uh, and in our case, for like security, like if we can save time and mental bandwidth for like those redundant operation and have more time to like learn, you know, I think it would, it would be a huge progress uh, for us. Yeah, cool. So a, a tool that we might bring to bear on uh, our, our large data problems as as uh, <laughs> as and when they occur yeah no fair enough yeah, I, no, I find I, that I, I find the term ai a, a complete pet hate having actually <laughs> studied it at university and um just wanting to replace it with machine learning every time somebody mentions it because it's not it's just applied it's just to against it's people yeah, it's just a complex. Oh, it's LLM loop, isn't it? and uh, GNN. It's like the new, uh, the new uh, keywords. If you want to look yeah. into it, it's LLM and GNN. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, and I think it's. I think it's true. I was reading a, an article, um, which yep. um, we'll we'll link this in the show notes for people to, to have a read. Um, but in his article, um, there was research into having the code try and write an exploit for a vulnerability, so it. Like it's obviously querying the cesspit of the internet to find everything. And it found the vulnerability, wrote the code for it, but the code didn't run straight away. But then the researcher was able to go and prompt the chat GPT to go, um, like go to the next step. Like you need to change this bit of code for that to work. So while it didn't straight out write malware, which is I think probably some of the clickbait that we're seeing with chat GPT, but an experienced individual didn't have to spend time writing a writing an exploit, so it it made their workload more efficient, which I think is what you were saying. Like, like across organizations, like good and bad, offense and defense, we can try and figure out how we can use that for efficiencies to free yep. people up to do other things for the stuff that's being done. It's just you have to go search the internet for it, and we're kind of giving a program. Um, the information to do that for us so that's that's and pretty it depends exciting on the quality of your question too you know like that's mm. also like two mm. ways uh like like you just said you know like for like code reviews because you kind of define the scope of what you yeah. want to do it can work like pretty well you know i'm sure like uh we're gonna see more and more of that for like code reviews you know there is github copilot which is kind of like using something similar 
yeah. uh, for documenting like source code, you know, all those things. Um, there is like a lot of uh, benefits for sure, yeah. Yeah, code programmers will never have to comment their own code ever again because they'll just push it into chat TPT. <laughs> I mean, oh, pretty much terrifying <laughs> thought yeah you, you can use it to like summarize documents you know we are yeah. talking like if you have a fr- because like if you're like a security researcher like oh you still need to be involved with like all the policy makers to make sure that whatever comes out as a regulation because it's gonna happen anyway still has mm. uh, still makes mm. sense and uh yeah we're just joking like well now at least like all those like documents you know which is like a lot of gibberish can be like summarized, like uh, in short, like paragraphs. Mm. Uh, same thing with legal mm. documents, you know, because there is a lot because of the language that's used, you know, that a lot of the information can be like summarized. Yeah, I think I'm going to get it to rewrite my CV. Actually, I've been meaning to do it for a while. <sighs> I can't be bothered. So yeah. yeah, maybe that's the optimal use case. We'll get him to write the blurb for this this show. Actually, we should do I mean, that. Uh, Let's do that. Go on. Well, yeah, we'll get we'll we'll, yeah, it feed it some prompts and see what it comes out with. <laughs> So, uh, aside from messing around with GPT, a poem or a song, you know, you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it'll be. Please write a blurb about Matt uh, for our podcast in the format of Doctor Seuss. <laughs> I am looking forward to this. I'm, I'm doing so, it now. I'm telling you. <laughs> there we go. It'll be on the show for sure. Definitely in the show. In the format of who? Doctor Seuss. Doctor Seuss. Yeah, Doctor Seuss. How do you spell it? S U E S S. S. There you go. S U E S S. You don't have children yet. That's what it is. No, it's been years since I've owned a Doctor Seuss book. I've seen some some very interesting Chat GPT stuff. Just in should our be, work should be, should be in rhyme. Okay, uh, that's ready. Once upon a time, not long ago, in the land of forensics, there was a show called the Forensic Focus Podcast. You know where they talk about all forensic. Oh, ho. <laughs> the host of this show. I know, they say I was the host, you know, like, uh, <laughs> it was smart and funny. Never once did they chat. About boring things? Oh no, not that. His guests were experts. Okay, we need to change the question to make sure he knows who are the us, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it. We'll, we'll try some prompts and get something up, but yeah, that's right. Really I mean, yeah. for like rhymes and stuff, you know, like it's going to come out like perfectly. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Better than I would manage. Mm. <laughs> so apart from um, apart from messing with GPT and Dr. Seuss, uh, what, what do you uh, do outside of forensics to... Uh, to stay fresh, to to keep your mind going, to to be, uh, you know, uh, not stuck in front of a computer twenty four seven. That's a it's a good question. Uh, but I, like, I guess the, you know, there's a, I don't know if you ever noticed, but there is a bit of a trend in security people doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So I, I guess is I he... try to do that. A... Oh, that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I've noticed I've noticed some interesting trends. I've seen baking come and go. Um, mm. Yeah, that, that's, that's the like thing. the COVID trend. <laughs> that's the COVID trend. But that that seems to have been it seemed to have peaked slightly before for 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 DFIR and it's, there's there's a little sort of background of that the DFIR fit uh, stuff. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some yeah. uh, some, some martial artists. Yeah, but yeah, it's just like uh, mostly like conferences. Uh, to be honest, uh, even speaking of conferences, like. Uh, Next year, we have uh, two conferences by uh, Magnet. So we have like our virtual summit happening mm. uh, at the end of uh, February. And the uh, physical like uh, summit, like the Magnet user summit, that's happening in Nashville, like uh, mid airport. So some interesting traveling and uh, you know, like conferences, you know, like it's usually like uh, the, <laughs> the easiest way to stay away from the, uh, the computer. But yeah, I, I, I like no, talking no. about computer stuff. So. Like, <laughs> It's just it's one of those so things, isn't it? Good screen, good screen, good screen bad screen all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, excellent, good stuff. Well, we really appreciate you uh, giving up your time to, to to chat with us today. It's been it's been really interesting, really good fun. Um, yeah, and um, I, I, as as Matt was saying, um, if you want to hear more from him next year. Uh, you can check out his presentation. He's got uh, Know When to Seek Help for Memory Loss, 
uh, which I must admit sounds like fun, uh, both at the Magnet Virtual <laughs> Summit and the User Summit um, in 2023. The Virtual Summit is going to be held, well, strangely, virtually, uh, from February 21st to March 2nd. Uh, and we'll have 55 presentations from 60, 55, more than 55 presentations from 60 industry mm. experts. Um, and the user summit is in Nashville, which frankly sounds really cool. And um, I'd love to go go and visit Elvis's house and all sorts of cool things like that. Um, yeah, but that Music runs City. from April. Music City, yeah. Runs from April mm. 17th to the 19th um, and gives you the opportunity to go and connect with uh, a load of other DFIR professionals. Um, and we'll see if we can send Alex or something, uh, and uh, you can have a chat yes, with him, please. and he'll do a live live broadcast recording uh, there if we can arrange it. Um, and you'll get to learn more about the latest from Magnet Forensics and their solutions and uh, other trends going on in the field. Um, you can register online, and we'll put the links in the show notes so that you don't have to try and uh, copy them down as we go along. But magnetvirtualsummit.com or magnetusersummit.com. Um, and uh, we hope to see as many of you as possible uh, attending and hopefully, possibly, one of us actually being there as well. Um, but we'll see about that. I, we'll have to fight it out for who wants to go to Nashville. That's the thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, anyway, definitely. Does, it does sound uh, really good. But, um... It does sound really good. And, um, yeah, from what I've seen of, of uh, Magnet Tools in the past, they are, are, are very nice bits of uh, software to, to have, have fun and play with. So, um, again, just to say uh, thank you very much again, Matt. It's been a pleasure talking to you and really interesting. Um, we hope that we can have an opportunity to catch up again in the future and learn about what's going on in memory forensics and, uh, and with Magnet and, uh, and ChatGBT for, for that matter. <laughs> so you take care. Uh, Desi, yeah, as always, a pleasure. Uh, the lovely Desi. You too, um, Sai. <laughs> it's all good. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much to all our listeners. Thanks, Cheers. Matt. Bye. Yep.